idea. We allow that idea to grow and grow, and it does. So we really try to own the whole enterprise technology space. I mean, that's what we're all about. We take analysis, we take publishing, we take news, and we take live TV, and we combine it together in a product and share that with our community. No one's doing what we're doing. Uh, what we're doing, in my opinion, is the future of media, the future of television, the future of the internet. Video is an amazing, powerful product. So we work in what John and I talk about as a data model. People always say to us, well, how do you guys make money? We sell knowledge, we sell information, we sell data. So the problem that we, are, that we identified is about what we call big, fast, total data. Anybody can analyze a gigabyte of data. If you do 1,000 gigabytes, that's a terabyte of data. You take 1,000 terabytes, that's a petabyte of data. 1,000 petabytes, that is zettabyte of data. So you are talking big data, lots and lots of data, and can you analyze it in real time as it comes in, right? The Cube is like we call ESPN of tech because we want to cover technology like ESPN covers sports. John has a great vision for what's going to happen next in tech. And so John is sort of that alter ego of mine that lets me see the future. We have a really amazing team of people that work with us. Michael Sean Wright, Mark Hopkins, you know, we've got Kim here today. We've got a team of people on our news desk uh, run by Kristen Nicole. So she has a team that help feed us the news of the day, what's happening, the analysis. We have a team of analysts, and they feed us information about what's happening. And then, really importantly, we have a community, a big community of, of many hundreds of contributors. We love technology, we love, we love the innovation, and that's what we do. We want to create a great user experience. And in order to do that properly, you've got to really, really prepare. The Cube for the past year that we've been in operation has been very, very successful. And uh, you know, companies do pay us to come here. I think the companies who have bring us in with the Cube get two things. They get a third party independent resource to provide knowledge to their audience who are seeking it. There's demand for the, for the product. And also complements their existing media. Uh, we're here at an event and uh, the, you know, the company has their own TV organization and they have to pay a premium for that. So we complement that by offering a objective, organic, third party, independent analysis of the event. That's why the top executives come in here. The Cube is a comfortable place. It's a place where people feel happy and are happy to share their knowledge with the world. And uh, we're happy to, to be ambassadors of, of that knowledge transfer. My entire career has been really built on relationships and talking to people and extracting knowledge from people, largely in a belly-to-belly -belly private forum. What theCUBE does is it explodes that to a huge audience. I mean, we've reached millions with theCUBE, and it's real time, it's live TV, so you've got to be quick on your feet, but you learn very fast, and then you iterate from that learning. So John and I play off of that, and we're constantly trying to up our game.
Hey everyone, hi, it's Alex Williams here of SiliconANGLE. SiliconANGLE, where, where we are the leaders in this news, new kind of video coverage out there. I mean, in doing live news of coverage and interviews from events like Node Summit, where we are today. Great to have you here today. Uh, Solomon Hikes, how are you? Hi, I'm great, thanks. And I'm here with my colleague in crime, uh, Clint Finley. Clint and I manage Services Angle, and we really try to focus a lot on, on developer issues, and in particularly the platform. And I know, Clint, you've written um, about .cloud, as, as have I. What do, you, what do you think distinguishes .cloud from the rest? And perhaps then we can follow up that with some questions. Yes, oh, Clint, I'm curious. Oh, uh, I, I actually think Solomon should, uh, should answer that. Well, from your perspective. From my perspective? Yeah. Uh, to be honest, I don't, I, I don't know. At this point, uh, you know, the other uh, cloud providers are going polyglot pretty quickly. Uh, so I, you know, I think the heat really is on on dot cloud right now to differentiate. Yeah. And, so how uh, are you how, how are you adjusting to that? So yeah, it's it's uh, it's pretty exciting. I mean, we a year ago now we launched the first platforms of service that actually supported more than lang language, and at the time it was kind of very new, right? Everyone was doing their one stack, and here we were saying you can run software built with any stack. It doesn't matter what language you're using, what database. Um, and as you said, multiple players now have adjusted and are following that lead. I think it's really exciting. And I think anybody who's not doing that is, should think about it. Um, my personal opinion on the, on the space right now is that it's only the very beginning, right? We're, we're at a very early stage where a, f a few players defined a model that worked, and now everyone's kind of replicating it and um, creating variations of it. Right? But, what it. But what is the business model? Oh, that's a very different question. Um, yeah, so, so there's, a, there's right, different so models I'm, involved here. I'm writing on two questions. So the, the, there's the product experience, right? right? How developers experience deploying right. their code on platform as a service. And then there's how are we going to make money with it. All right, let's go with the product experience and we'll get into the business model. All right, I'm writing that down. <laughs> uh, so I just think platform as a service has the potential to change how developers work, uh, period. Right? Every single developer should see the way they work changed radically by platforms of service in the next few years. Mm -hmm. Right now, we're barely touching the first percent of developers, right? So I think there's a huge task. The burden is on all of us. You, you talk about heat. I think the heat is on all of us to think about how we can make the model evolve without being just another git push for this language or git push for that language. Uh, so we, we, in our case, are working on a lot of different um, projects to change that experience. For example, one thing we're very um, strict about is that your stack should be running in one place. Right? And right now, a model that is very common is there's a little piece of your app here, and then third-party providers through an add-on system are going to run your database, your caching layer, your messaging layer, whatever. Uh, we think if it's a critical piece of your app, if your app is down, if, it, if that piece is down, then it should be managed by the same operations team, it should be under the same SLA, there should be a uniform runtime under it with the same guarantees and the same mechanisms. And so that's something we've been pushing from the very first day. We run your database, we run your app layer, we run your workers, whatever you want to call them, all in one place. And that's the part that we make flexible. So that's one way we're different. Uh, in general, I would say that the the goal for platforms as a service is to define a new standard uh, way to deploy code, right? A new standard computing platform, and the platform with a capital P in the truest sense of the word. And I think right now we're we're still at that early phase where we're catering to some subsets of of the developer community to certain stacks, but certainly not to all of them. Um, so I think we all have work to do, basically. Okay. Okay. Well. Um and I'm still remembering you yeah. asked about the, the business model. Yeah, so I'm curious about that. I mean, because we're seeing lots of public cloud providers, and there's some, there's some ones that are kind of like a hybrid, really. But the space is still quite unknown, but there's a lot of CIOs out there who have a lot of uh, buying power who are still very much tied into their infrastructure. And they have still have reservations about public pass environments. And so I'm curious how you guys are going to play in to that market or, or, or what exactly your model is. So, um, so the first question is before you talk about how do you make money with platform as a service, the question is do you want to? Do you actually want 
to create a sustainable business, a large business that can grow right. uh, based on platforms as a service. And I think when I look around in the space, I see a lot of players answering no. Right? And uh, in fact, if you look at kind of the, the leading pack, right, the Mac Microsoft, uh, Salesforce, Google, etc., cetera, um, none of these guys are a large business focused on pass. They're a large business focused on something else, and they either have, they happen to have an internal product that deploys people's code, or they just bought a startup. And that startup in turn decided, okay, no, we're not gonna build a sustainable business with platform as a service, we're just gonna sell. Um, and I believe it's possible. So it becomes another item in their catalog. Huh? Exactly, and I think that changes a lot of things, even subtly in the beginning, but uh, I think, in fact, developers need players that are focused on doing just that, just helping them deploy their code, deliver it to the world in the best possible way, and that should be their business. There shouldn't be, it shouldn't be dependent on another business. So my answer is that it's possible, mm -hmm. and we want to do it. Mm -hmm. And if you look at everything we've done in the last year and a half, we've been gearing towards that from the very beginning. So we raised more money than we needed to at the time. Right? We raised a total of uh, $11 million. Uh, we're, we raise it from players that are known uh, for being patient, yep. and they don't mind their investment, their portfolio companies being misunderstood for a while. Right. Um, and I think in general, we positioned ourselves in a way that made it possible to make money. Right. So the short version is, if you want to make money making developers happy, you've got to separate developers and IT, and you've got to find a way to make them work together. Right. That's my short answer. Clint? Yeah, I, I'd like to actually maybe move on and we can start talking about how Node.js fits into .cloud. Uh, what are some of the business use cases that you've, that you've seen from maybe some of your customers or from other uh, mm -hmm. developers? So the, the, we run a horizontal platform, right? So you can run a lot of different things on .cloud and because of that we can see patterns of activity. We can see cool things being built by developers in a lot of different areas. Uh, and so pretty early on, when we, we kind of officially launched Node.js support, we saw uh, really, really strong activity. Right? We just saw all sorts of cool stuff being built almost overnight. And the, the amount of energy was, was pretty uh, impressive. Um, at some point, there was kind of a war on the platform between the Node.js hackers and the Perl hackers trying to um, uh, competing for the, the highest level of, of activity for that month. Um, in general, I think Node.js is, is really, really interesting because it's, it's the home of a very, very bleeding edge movement. Uh, and the, the general sentiment is, let's see how far we can push the boundaries, right? Let's see if we can try something really new and sometimes wacky. And so, uh, to answer your question, we see, we see two patterns. We see hackers um, experimenting, right? So per a lot of personal projects, a lot of open source code, um, a lot of community activity. And we also see larger established applications that are adding capabilities with Node.js. So typically these are hybrid applications that are not built from the ground up with Node.js. Instead, they may be a Rails app, they may be a, a, using a Python framework, a PHP app, Java. We have all of these examples and they're adding new components to their app uh, and they're taking advantage of Node.js for these new components uh, for, for, to add really cool stuff, right? So examples would be adding a really reactive interface element to their app uh, to make their, their user experience more responsive. Maybe it's push notifications in the browser. Um, maybe it's chat. Maybe uh, it's, it's a cool interactive map that displays elements live. Um, or maybe it's uh, integration with a third-party API, right? So another use case we see a lot is when there's a lot of inputs and outputs with third-party services. Maybe you're uh, interacting by email with the users with a service like Mailgun, right? You're sending and receiving text messages with something like Twilio, right? You're, you're parsing streams of social data from Twitter's API, Facebook's API, and somehow all these inputs and outputs have to work together, right? That's also a very very uh, solid use case for, for Node.js. And the, the asynchronous nature of Node.js, is that what makes it good for, for doing things like working with a third party API so that you can kind of keep things flowing without uh, interrupting something else? Yeah, the, the, um, I think that's one of, that's one of the, the, the strong points. Um, another one is that 
so yes, the Node.js community and in general Node.js code, um, the reasoning is about streams, right? Streams of data that you uh, move around, interact with without c blocking the entire application. Uh, Node.js is also very friendly to small, concise pieces. If you look at NPM, the Node.js package manager, there is you know, thousands of packages that do one very small thing, but they do it well. Right? And that's really the spirit is, I have a new idea, I'm going to create a new module. And that works really well on a platform like DocCloud because we recommend that developers architect their app as a stack of very concise, loosely connected uh, components. And not all these components have to be written in the same language. So it's very easy to add a Node.js piece that does one thing really well. Right, so that, that I think that plugs really well into the community spirit of, of Node.js. What kind of trends are you seeing in terms of uh, Node.js tools, like uh, frameworks, like Express? Are, are those being adopted rapidly? Is, what, what sort of things are being used? And then we're going to have to wrap up, but right. yeah, oh, let's hear okay. it. Uh, so yeah, they, they, these frameworks are very popular. I think the, the cycle of new things becoming popular is, is, is very, you know, it, it, that revolves very quickly in the Node.js world. I think definitely, any successful library or framework is going to have to be compatible with the Node.js spirit, which is don't make it big and bloated and do everything. Do one piece that does one thing well. In a way, it's very connected to the, the Unix philosophy, right? One tool for one task, plug tools together. That's, that's definitely how the Node.js community works. Okay. Well, good. Well, well thank you very much for uh, some, taking some time to, to talk with us. My pleasure. And we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see you soon. All right. Great, Salm Reich, uh, CEO of DocCloud. This is Alex Williams, and you're here with my colleague, uh, Clint Finley. We are the people behind Services Angle. We're going to take a five minute break, and, and we'll actually, it's more like two minute break. So we'll be back in just a few minutes to talk with the folks from Mapbox. So we'll be right back.
Hi, this is Clint Finley with Silicon Angle. I'm joined today by uh, two of the people behind Mapbox. Uh, could you guys introduce yourselves? Yeah, uh, my name is Eric Anderson at Mapbox. Hey, and uh, I'm Will White at Mapbox. And I understand you guys, we're at uh, Node Summit today, and uh, I understand you guys are using uh, Node.js quite a bit in your application. Uh, but maybe uh, first we could talk a little bit about what uh, Mapbox is. Yeah. So uh, Mapbox is an open source platform that allows you to design uh, really fast and beautiful maps and then share them either on the web or, or on a mobile. So this, this basically means two things. One, there's, there's a design studio called Tilemill that you can download and run actually on your desktop. So you can take data, whether it's you know like a spreadsheet, whether it's open street map data, open data from your city, and design a totally custom map. Once you have that map designed, you can you can share that anywhere. Uh, so we also run a cloud-based platform that allows you to upload that map and then integrate that map actually into your own application via via our API. So we're using Node actually on both our desktop design application and in the cloud for really fast map serving. Okay. Uh, can you go into a little more detail then about how uh, how uh, Node actually fits into that? Kim, yeah. Will, you want to talk yeah. about some of the platform? Yeah, sure. Um, for Tilemill, we use Node. On, it's cross-platform now, so that's really exciting for us. So we use Node. Um, it's a desktop application. You download it. You actually run uh, the Node binary and it spins up a window for you on uh, Linux, Mac OS X, and now Windows. So we're writing uh, native code um, for the GUI, uh, and then uh, since it's web-based, we just set up a browser uh, environment and hit the server. We're using Express, um, uh, you know, Connect, and uh, CouchDB. We're, we're sort of all the usual suspects in the Node stack for all that. And, but to the end user, it's totally transparent. The, what's crazy about this is it's literally a one-click install. So this has been out for a while on Mac and, uh, and Linux, but tomorrow is a big announcement going, going into the Windows. And that's because Tilemill is now going to be running on Node 0.6, and we're going to have a full, fully native Windows app. So what sort of things uh, does Node enable you to do either that you would not have been able to do before or that would have been more difficult? Yeah, so the speed wins for map rendering are are enormous for us. Yeah, and and also uh, the just the language itself, JavaScript is is a is a really sort of a dream for our team to use. Um, we really like to write JavaScript, um, and there are a few frameworks out there that that work in both the browser and on, on the server side, and we're really we like to take advantage of that a lot. Okay. Why uh, JavaScript instead of using something like uh, Python with Twisted or uh, Java with Netty? Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, the, just the, the way you structure the code, the uh, callbacks, it's just sort of natural for, for us. We find it easier to write. Um, and then Node, of course, has this amazing ability. You can write the add-ons. Uh, and we're lucky enough to have some, some pretty amazing C++ developers on our team. So a lot of the heavy lifting, the map rendering that Eric was talking about, um, we actually go, out, we um, leave the JavaScript land and go into C++ land. We have uh, a few packages that, like Node Mapnik, for example, um, are, is, is Node bindings for the Mapnik render, map rendering library. And having a tight C++ based connection to uh, Mapnik for, for map rendering is pretty much essential and allows us to um, parallelize, use multiple cores, uh, and, and really speed up rendering quite a bit. And the, I mean, the business opportunities that this has opened are, are enormous. I mean, the fact that you know we're we're a small team based in based in DC. We've got about we have over 10, 10 developers working with Node. But the fact that we're now able to make a Windows play like this um, that's that's incredible. And then on the server side, this is even getting getting more exciting, right? We're uh, we, we are just today releasing our full world uh, map base layer, all powered by OpenStreetMap data, like the Wikipedia of maps. And so we actually, by, by having Node running in, in our cloud platform and actually having those maps be really fast, uh, we have a really viable alternative now for a world base layer for people to use. And the timing of this is pretty interesting. Uh, right. So people can completely replace Google Maps in their, in their applications if they're, if they're using the Google Maps API. They can now replace that wholesale with 
with matte box, is that right? And something customized, so it's a base layer that they have full control over. Yeah. Right. So we both provide out of the box base layers, and they can also tweak that out. And, and people are doing this. Uh, so but people could also use Google Maps with with, uh, with uh, map map box as well if they wanted to. Is that right? Exactly. Right. Okay. So like, you, let, let's say you want to design just like a crime map, and then overlay that on top of Google Maps. Totally, totally fine. So like the, the fact, and whether it's Google Maps, whether it's Bing, whether it's OpenStreetMap, the fact that this is all uh, this is all standards based. Uh, opens up a lot of flexibility to the end user, uh, and we're, we're we're really seeing people uh, people take advantage of this. Street Easy, uh, it's a real estate company up in New York. They designed this gorgeous uh, base layer of New York City, and now their now their actual like site has a really unique experience. But but also like it helps their business. They can actually highlight the exact neighborhoods they want to highlight next to listings, the exact restaurants they want to highlight next to listings, and by switching to Mapbox from Google Maps. They're going to save over two hundred thousand dollars this coming up. Wow! So with that Windows client, Node.js is going to be running on people's Windows desktops, just completely unbeknownst to them. Basically, they, I mean, they they have no reason to to know or care that that there's Node.js under the hood. It's they when they run the uh, the Windows installer, that it's just going to get installed for them. That's yeah. is that how it works? Yeah, yeah it's totally it's packaged, self-contained. Um, the, we have a Windows uh, setup, and it extracts uh, all the Node.js files into place, and um, they're all stored al along with the other application files. And when you start up the application, as I said, um, it just comes up in a window, uh, like a native Windows GUI uh, window, and which props up a, a, an embedded, um, we're using Chromium embedded. Uh, so you have sort of a mini Chrome browser, uh, but it doesn't look like it. For all you know, it would it would just be um, totally native UI components. Um, uh, but yeah, it's it's a it's actually you can open up your web browser and get to it, setting up a little server using Express. How difficult was it to port to Windows? I mean, I know that Node.js now runs natively on Windows. Uh, did you run into any problems uh, moving your stuff over? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, for the most part, uh, the difference between, so, so Node added Windows support in Node 06. Um, and other than that, the difference between Node 04, which is what we were on, and Node 06, there are very few differences. So in terms of, of getting up to speed there, um, uh, that was pretty straightforward. Uh, the biggest challenges we ran into were really, um, you know, we don't have any in-house Windows developers. Um, we have some expert C++ developers who had been working on Windows here and there, but when it really came down to um, getting the packaging down and the build system down and setting up all these, uh, a build machine and, and build scripts and Visual Studio, we sort of were, uh, you know, had to bear the, bear the learning curve a little bit. Um, and so I, I'd say that was the biggest challenge, but, um, uh, it, it, you know, a lot of credit goes to the to the core dev team um, of Node because it, it was it was a pretty uh, pretty nice experience. What kind of trends are you seeing? Because uh, I, I I assume you're in contact with developers at other companies who are using Node. Uh, what do you, what are you seeing out there from from other developers playing around with Node? Mm -hmm. Well, um, every month. Uh, in, in DC, we host uh, the Node DC meetup, um, and we have a, a, a good group of people that come out, uh, uh, probably 15 regulars, and um, so far, a lot of people are experimenting, having a lot of fun um, with uh, connectors, middleware, scripts, that kind of thing. Um, but there, every every week, or every, sorry, every month, uh, some, someone else comes in and says, I have a new application that's launched, it's live, it's stable, it's in production. Um, so we're really seeing it pick up speed in, in our area at least. And um, uh, I know we have the uh, Node Knockout uh, winners, uh, Doodle or Die. They, uh, they come to the meetup and, and they, have a, they have a lot of fun with it. Great. I have, I have, what kind of problems do you, have you seen any people run into? Uh, do you know of any? Um, stumbling blocks. Uh, a lot of a lot of questions about what uh, database backend to use. Uh, a lot of questions about um, asynchronous programming uh, strategies and patterns to sort of work around some of the challenges there. Um, but a lot of these a lot of these problems have really great answers because there's there's such a good community that's pr contributing a lot of code. 
Do, are you seeing a lot of front-end developers make the switch to doing back-end development via Node.js, or is it more back-end developers starting to learn JavaScript or? Yeah, about? it's amazing because it's totally going both ways. Um, uh, the the audience at the meetup um, and at NodeConf, um, it was you know NodeConf last year was tacked onto the end of JSConf, so you're seeing people sort of um, back-end developers. Uh, Think, oh wow, Node.js is a pretty powerful application for backend development. I'm going to get in. I'm going to get into that, and then all of a sudden they find themselves like, oh, JavaScript's not that hard. I'm going to start writing in the browser, it's, and it works the other way too. I I, I talk to a lot of um, front end developers using jQuery or or just traditionally working in the browser. They're totally familiar with uh, the behavior, the asynchronous behavior of JavaScript. And now they're feeling sort of empowered because they can write, um, you know, a login form or, or, you know, build a whole web application on, on on their own. And I mean, that that was critical to retooling our team, right? So we started using Node, uh, what October two thousand nine? Yeah, it's our first site. So and then just making that transition across the engineering team. Uh, it was, it, was, it was really neat to see, hey, wait, we actually have a lot of these basics already down. And that, that allowed us to quickly scale up and quickly make the switch. How difficult is it to, to learn the, uh, the asynchronous model? I mean, that's a, a really different way of, of thinking and programming. Um, yeah, you're going to get burned a few times when you're learning. Um, but uh, there are some tools that help you out. Um, you know there are a few asynchronous libraries. Um, underscore JS is a is a is a library that runs on the client and on the server, uh, and in Node um, that helps out. Um, Step is a, is another one. If I'm going to drop some names, um, we're using help you sort of just manage callbacks and and, and um, it prevents you from having to nest a lot of code. Um, so uh, and there's just some best practices you can you you can implement there. You mentioned uh, questions about. Database backends as well, and you, uh, you said you're using CouchDB. Yeah. Uh, how is, has CouchDB's integration with Node.js been, and what are some of the other databases you've seen people work with? Uh, I think the most popular one. Uh, there, t there are two real popular ones. I think Mongo is really popular um, with the community, and Redis um, is is quite popular. I think it's. Uh, at least a few months ago, I saw a stat that uh, Node Redis was the n number one downloaded module from N the NPM repository. Um, but we're using Couch just because of um, its amazing replication features. Um, it allows you to uh, run two servers at once, and uh, they sort of catch up to each other um, uh, with re reads and writes. And um, we really like to the fact that you can write. Um, your MapReduce and your queries in JavaScript, so that's what that's what we're that's what we're sticking with, and we've had a lot of fun with it so far. Well, it sounds like you've got some pretty exciting things coming tomorrow with the Windows client. What else is on your roadmap? What What are you thinking about for the future? Yeah, um, we we need to make it a li a little easier to work with data. I mean, making a map is like the design side is now really figured out uh, with TileMill. But making, really scaling this into a larger market, especially the Windows market, uh, we're going to need to make sure that uh, people can quickly combine data sets together. Uh, I think that's going to be a lot of, lot of heavy lifting in the next, uh, next couple months. OK, well, uh, thanks a lot for coming on, guys. Uh, we're going to go ahead and take a break here pretty soon. Uh, well, thank you. Yeah, well, uh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks. Good. Thanks. the founder of SiliconAngle.com, SiliconAngle.tv, and we're here live in San Francisco, California at the Node Summit, uh, which is a, the first inaugural conference celebrating the rapid development and uh, success of a technology called Node.js. And uh, we are here on the ground with theCUBE, our flagship telecast, where we're going to broadcast here all the content and knowledge from the people here in the trenches of the developer crowd, and we're going to share that with you out on, on the internet. So. Uh, uh, thanks for watching. You can uh, continue to watch on SiliconAngle.tv and for all the coverage, uh, SiliconAngle.com. And I'm excited to uh, to talk about 
to this environment because we are going to be launching a new publication called DevOps Angle, where we're going to explore in depth the impact of developers with the cloud and within mobile. Um, so we're here in San Francisco to cover the Node Summit, where all the emerging companies are really, really powering with this new technology. Um, Joyent got funded for $85 million yesterday. Um, massive excitement, um, kind of a movement from a developer standpoint. So we're excited to hear, and I'm here with my co-host today, who's going to be roaming the floors, uh, getting guests, and, and uh, talking to the folks. Alex Williams, the editor of SiliconAngle.com's Enterprise and Vertical Publications of Services Angle, and now DevOps Angle. Alex, uh, you know, you, you are a prolific writer. Obviously, SiliconAngle now, Read Write Web. You've been around the block. Uh, you live in Portland. You've been covering the tech scene for a while. Um, Tell us what you're seeing and how it feels to you right now in terms of what is Node Summit? Um, obviously, we'll go deep dive into this with the developers, but what, what's, what's the vibe and what's, what's the scene like? Explain to the folks here. Th this is really kind of a, a defining time right now, uh, especially when you think about some of the big trends that we're seeing. Uh, you know, the uh, platform as a service, I think, is a major trend, and they're actually inside talking about it right now. And so with platform as a service, you know, we see lots of ability to do cross-platform stuff like we had not been able to do before. And, you know, that, that's a big deal where you can, you know, develop in, in that manner without really the need for an operating system. That's going to have a, a big impact on things. So I think people are pretty excited, too, about Node.js and just its, you know, its capabilities and the ability to, you know, work with people who are proficient in JavaScript and be able to then uh, start to really... Oh, build on Node.js. For the folks out there who are watching, whether you're a geek, a developer, or someone in the, in the tech business, Node.js really is about a fundamental development environment that takes advantage of the web. And to me, Alex, I think this is like a web 2.0 moment where the reality of the web kind of Web 2.0, all the promise of Web 2.0, which some of it really hasn't been realized, some have and some hasn't, but Node really represents that Web next generation technology, leveraging the browser. Um, obviously, um, Node was built on top of Google's V8 virtual machine, which powers Chrome and all the stuff going on with Android and among other things uh, to oversimplify it. But in reality, this is about the Web. And the web, we all typed in URLs, HTTP colon slash slash. That is the fundamental transport protocol for the web. So web technologies have been around. Apps are, apps are being written. But for the first time, a development framework like JavaScript, which developers know to develop that front end, uh, the websites, et cetera, can now be deployed on the back end, as they say. So the back end is, is servers, the back end is networking. So this is really a fundamental shift from a development standpoint that opens the doors for rapid development, scalability, some things we've never seen before. So we're going to explore that here at Node Summit. We're going to ask all the questions. We're going to ask the gurus uh, about Node.js, deployments at scale, the most successful sites that are using it, what are the developers finding successful, not successful. So Node.js represents a fundamental change in the development and the scripting environment, which has been predominant on the web and allowed us to have that great web experience. Now it's going to the next level. So we're going to monitor this. Uh, there's a lot of tech talk we're going to be uh, engaged in, so it's going to be exciting. Um, the event is not being streamed live, so we're going to be having the live coverage. We'll try to do our best to interview the candidates that come off the stage, uh, but you're getting some tweets from uh, Clint Finley, who's out in the crowd. What's the update from Clint? Uh, you know, Clint actually just got through the uh, cross-platform uh, uh, discussion, and some interesting things there um, by Ryan Dahl, for instance, he made the point that Ruby hasn't been ported to Windows and that has hurt their community, which I think is an interesting, it's an interesting time for people who, in, in the Ruby community, and I think that's illustrative of that. The other thing about Node that, that people are, are talking about is the, um, the fact that it simplifies the abstractions of, of, of code, the dependency of these back-end technologies like TCP, IP, and, and other server-related environments. And you know, the question is, and, and for the developer community, it's, it's pretty known that Python and, and Ruby on Rails has been a very successful um, environment for developers. So the question that comes up is, why Node over Ruby and, uh, and uh, 
and Python. So we're going to explore that. And so there's a debate amongst the developer community, and uh, that's good for us because we want to explore that. And, yeah. And we'll d we'll do a deep dive on that. It's still but it's still really early too. I mean, this is these are really really early days, and you know that's what's, what we're hearing right now in the discussion about platform as a service, which is going on right now. And you know, even though you know Heroku has a million apps. Um, that really isn't all that much in the grand scheme of things. I mean, I think we're seeing just a huge scaling in apps across, you know, developer communities who are just able to build apps, like you're saying, very, very, very quickly. And this is just the beginning of it. So we also want to share with you some news that SiliconAngle.com broke that I wrote this morning. Um, uh, EMC Ventures out here in the West Coast, Mark Lewis has left EMC. I confirmed that last night. Um, that is breaking news on SiliconAngle.com. And, and really, as I wrote in my post, we've been following EMC, obviously, for many, many years, at least from my standpoint. I've been following Mark Lewis's career from afar. I've gotten to know him personally um, and uh, found out just last night that he's leaving EMC Ventures and stepping down. And Mark Lewis is one of those operating executives who's been in the business. Uh, he's in his late 40s. He's, he's close to my age and uh, knows the computer business. He's an operator. But really, he's known for really having that strategic vision and, and really part of the EMC transformation, Alex. And what's interesting is Pat Gelsinger, who's a Cube alum on many times, is taking over for him. So Pat is obviously from Intel. Intel's had a very great, successful venture capital practice. He's tight with Paul Moritz. We've always called it the Intel, uh, you know, Wintel model for the cloud as VMware, EMC. So EMC has been very successful with their venture capital group. They've had huge successes just recently with uh, Silver Springs Networks, which has filed their S1 to go public, and Joyent, which announced an $85 million financing, which EMC was involved in. So just those two deals alone most recently will make EMC a lot of money. But more importantly, Mark Lewis was part of that early transformation and turning that storage company around into a powerhouse that it is. And he's uh, been you know, one of the guy, key guys, part of the whole being, bringing VMware to Joe Tucci at the right time, which from an acquisition standpoint was probably the best bargain ever in the history of the computer business. I yeah. think, you know, VMware and YouTube, in my mind, probably were the two best acquisitions in technology history in terms of value to the companies. Obviously, YouTube yeah. was 1.5 billion. Um, looks ridiculous now compared to what they're doing with, with uh, Google, but at the time it seemed huge. VMware, half a billion dollars. So Mark and Lewis is leaving EMC. Um, I got some of my sources to confirm that this is not the end of EMC Ventures, but just the beginning. They've done a good job. So EMC Ventures is uh, staying in business. Uh, the team is staying intact, just that Pat Gelsinger is taking over for it. I mean, that legacy lives on even here at, Node, at the Node Summit. The VMware is, is here in force. They're talking Cloud Foundry quite a bit. And VMware, I think, is a really interesting company to watch in the whole platform space. They are a hybrid provider. And, you know, we, we reported on the Accenture Technology Report that was published yesterday. And in it, they talk about platform as a service. And primarily, they talk about hybrids. And they say that the hybrid platforms are really the ones that will, uh, that, that, that's when they recommend for the CIOs. And so, you know, I think that really shows where VMware is right now. They're, they're moving up the stack. They want to compete with Microsoft, they, and they know that Cloud Foundry is a core part of that. We want to, want to welcome the Justin.tv uh, viewers who are watching. Thanks for, for joining with us. We have a, a good surge of folks up online right now. And uh, if you're a, a, a young young developer, young person into gaming, go to Justin TV. They have all the best gaming content out there. And uh, if you're young and you're a hacker, um, I think you're going to love Node.js. Node.js has huge success with hackers. Now, there's some technical reasons why that is, and we're going to try to get the founder of uh, Node.js, Ryan Dahl, on. But essentially, it, it allows for non-blocking event-based uh, programming. So that, that some people think that's a flaw. Some people think that's a good thing. So we're going to explore that. But if you're a hacker, they love this stuff. So I've talked to a few hackers last night, and you know they've been telling me that Node just totally accelerates their ability to code. So there will be a debate. We'll break that down, um, and we're going to talk about it. If you want to ask us questions uh, to dig answers for you here at the, at the Cube, here at the event, we will go out there and ask them. So go to Node Summit hashtag on Twitter. Just tweet out your question in the Cube, uh, pound the Cube as well, and we'll answer for you. So uh, that's great, and uh, we'll look for those questions. Any update from uh, Clint? Uh, uh, Clint, you know, Clint is in, inside. You know, again, it's the, the general theme is around uh, platform as a service and, and really where it is right now. Um, I'm looking at Twitter here, seeing what people are talking about. Um, 
Ryan Dahl is saying that to be a big platform, you have to be on Windows. Um, uh, what else do we have here? We have uh, people talking about um, how pass will uh, how pass will eclipse uh, infrastructure as a service, and that that's an interesting discussion there. Where infrastructure really is becoming just you, you know that ma the machinery that you need underneath the surface, and platform is what really. Alice, let's the bring in uh, Jason Hoffman, who's the CTO co-founder of Join. If you want to come in, come on in here, grab a seat, move move over. Uh, can you swing in there? Okay, let's make sure we get a good camera on him. Why don't you sit next to John? Is that good? Yeah, yeah, it's good, right in the middle. Okay. Okay, we have the uh, keynote speaker and uh, essentially the head honcho for why this event is so popular. Uh, Jason Hoffman is the hey. CTO, co-founder of Join. Did I get that right? You did. Okay. You did. Uh, <laughs> welcome to theCUBE. Hey. All I'm, right. I'm, I uh, was swinging by to use the, the potty, but it's very nice to nice. <laughs> end up in theCUBE instead. This is what we do at theCUBE. We talk <laughs> to the smartest people and try to share their knowledge with you and share it to the world. Uh, this guy right here, very successful, smart guy, knows the business, great guy. First time in theCUBE, so uh, he's, he's, the he's among many luminaries like Pat Gelsinger, Joe Tucci, Michael Beautiful. Capella, some, some luminaries. And wow. we have students, we have developers, so welcome to theCUBE. And uh, so, so you guys are ultra successful, obviously, uh, the news yesterday was uh, Joyin closed a massive funding, um, a Series E for you know the people who know what that means, but sure. 85 million dollars yep. in funding. You guys really don't need the money from the sources that we talk to, yeah. but it, you know it doesn't hurt to have money in the bank, and it's a validation to your mission and where you guys have come from. So just tell us the Joyin story for the folks who don't know it out there, from where you guys are today, but where you've come from, and what's happened just in these past short three years with sure. cloud and kind of the massive surge of app developers. Obviously we all know about the iPhone. So share with us the, the Joyent story and kind of the dynamics in the marketplace. Uh, well, I mean, you know, Joyent, we're an eight year old company. Uh, you know, we started um, really to do, you know, modern infrastructure for people. Um, and uh, we typically call ourselves, you know, a, a, an infrastructure system software company. And we also happen to run a, a pretty large service ourselves. Um, oddly enough, I think we're um, you know, not only sort of the uh, second largest infrastructure service provider after Amazon uh, right now, but uh, uh, we're also like the oldest surviving one. I think the only thing that was around before us was the Sun Grid, um, and you know even AWS basically launched launched after that. Um, you know, a lot of the sort of years of 2006, 2007, 2008 for the company was. Um, really around a lot of rapidly scaling startups based in the San Francisco area. Uh, we did a lot of for infrastructure for people like Twitter and you know Facebook's third party uh, um, you know applications and so on like that. Um, and the last couple of years has just been going global and working with a lot more what you'd call sort of enterprises and governments and so on, just doing infrastructure, infrastructure. infrastructure. Well, I want to say congratulations as an entrepreneur. It's a great thing to see, you know, someone build a business, stay in business, grow a yep. business, and, you know, be where the puck comes to you, right? And the thermal, that growth sure. takes you sure. takes you up. So so the question I have is, what are you seeing with Node? Node Summit, obviously, is an, it's an inaugural event here. Mm -hmm. uh, it kind of represents a new shift right now we're seeing from a developer community standpoint. You know, hackers love Node. Uh, yep. We're seeing real commercial deployments emerging at a yeah. scale point that yeah. traditionally was Interesting, right? You had to be a C programmer to do all some back-end work. Yep. Obviously, that skill set is the most coveted skill set, the, quote, back-end engineer who knows CSS or front-end. So yeah. Node seems to be kind of a mix of both that easy-to-program environment. Share with the folks why Node and why is this event so important? Well, I think we lucked out with a couple things. One, if we look at the general trends that are going on around application development, uh, we have ones where most applications are speaking HTTP. Um, so there really isn't these, there really aren't these enterprise applications or large scale applications doing you know, something other than web. Um, we also have seen sort of the breakdown of traditional client server type applications into a paradigm you'd really sort of call um, like real time data synced peers. And so, you know, instead of having a client on a phone and a server on the back end, you basically have a server here and a server there. Uh, and um, these guys are actually passing messages between one another. 
And so the other sort of trend that pops out as a result of that is we basically um, see message passing, you know, essentially popping up as the way that one does concurrency and those types of things. Um, and that makes sense because that's how we predominantly communicate as humans anyway. We send text messages, we write on post-it notes, um, and to have the back ends and front ends of applications uniformly do that as well becomes a very natural way to write applications. And then what's really driving this, though, on the back end is we see, for example, over the last, you know, two years, um, if we take iPhones, Android phones, and iPads, and we decide that we're going to call them PCs, they're 50% of the PC market. Um, I mean, you know, Apple shipping 200 million iPhones this year alone. So what you're saying, so, so you're saying is, is all this messaging stuff going on, these apps that are out there are taking advantage of these new, you know, quick bursty and or lightweight but important data sets that are going around. Yep. Um, I talked with Jonathan at Facebook who was, who was running their operation. He now stepped down. He's doing pursuing other things. This dev dev operational role yep. is among is, is known among the elite folks like Twitter, Facebook. Sure. They, they merge development and operations. Just as a plug for Silicon Angle, we're launching DevOpsAngle.com. It's a new section this week here at Node Summit. Yep. Um, and we, we have been covering and talking about, now we're going to have a publication around it, this notion of systems programming. Sure. In the old yeah. days when I went to school, systems were, you know, monolithic boxes yep. and or operating systems, and yeah, then yeah. that was, you know, on servers. Now you're talking essentially about essentially a, a modern operating system that's in a data center that's decoupled. Is that a well, big trend? I, I, yeah, I would say that what the, what the world's basically heading towards now is a world of devices where the network functions as a backplane and some of those devices are the size of a data center, some of those devices are the size of a phone, some, are the, some look like an airplane, some look like a car, some look like a refrigerator, um, that were really sort of sitting there and essentially shipping 20 to 40 CPUs per person on the planet per year, typically in some device of some type. Um, and beginning to start abstracting the world in that way, that basically you know, the node in Node.js comes with the concept that everything's a node. Um, and as we start thinking around everything being a node from a data center to a phone and so on, you know, how do we have a nice uniform platform layer on top of that that allows us to build new types of applications? And we have to build new types of applications because traditional frameworks and runtimes uh, typically are not connection intensive. They're not good at moving a lot of data. They're not good at those types of things. Um, and they're, it's not that they're just not good. They're like 10,000 times bad at it. Um, and so the idea that, you know, doing something as simple as trying to, you know, be a mobile carrier and have, you know, real-time tracking of all of the, say, phones on your network, you know, that shouldn't require 200,000 servers to do one application, you know. San Francisco is obviously the home of a lot of uh, revolutions and uh, rebellion and radicals and, you know, people talk about it. It's a great place and innovation comes here. You guys have had a lot of success, obviously, in this DevOps and the, in, in the web and internet and cloud, if you will, public cloud, however you want to define it, uh, doing a lot of emerging things. At the same time, a lot of people run their businesses that you're experienced with. Yeah. But the average Joe IT guys, and when I say jo average Joe, I mean big IT shops. Sure. They don't really have that experience. So could you talk about uh, two things. One, what are some of the challenges that an, a big IT shop, you know, multinational company, mm -hmm. has with this notion of really leveraging the cloud and cloud storage and networking sure. and the stuff that we just talked about, this, this new operating environment, new operating system, maybe I want to talk about it. Yeah. And then, um, what's the roadmap for them? How do they get from, hey, you know, we know we have to change, but how do I do DevOps? Is it, what does it mean to me? Well, it depends. I mean, for some people, it's not going to matter. Um, you know, where it, it is popping up in, say, enterprise, traditional enterprise IT much more commonly. And in a lot of ways, you can actually think of cloud providers as actually typically servicing developers in enterprises that couldn't be serviced by enterprise IT. That, that's one phenomena. You know, but the other thing that's sort of happening is that, you know, the typical enterprise application, you know, is usually used by five people between the hours of nine to five. And now all of a sudden, that same application, um, has to provide real-time data to a field sales force of 12,000 people on their mobile devices. Um, and so when you sort of sit around and, and you go to these, you know, Platinum Advisory Council, blah, blah, blah type things where there's, you know, 300 Fortune 500 CIOs at, every single one of them is using an iPad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, and so mobile access to enterprise data is typically what's crushing the enterprise IT story there. And then I think what most of those guys have to do is just to decide um, or what their other sort of main problem is 
is most people don't understand what value is actually created by your infrastructure. And so that's, a, that's the biggest problem, you know, that, that I have an IT budget of X amount, we spend it every year, but I have no idea how that spend relates to what my core business is, what my revenue is, and so on like that. So a lot of trans uh, the, the, the transformation around IT is really about go to market where the business leaders, this is what we're seeing as well, they see, hey, I want analytics, IT, make it happen. So they go, yeah. shit, I got to do something. Yep. Um, we have uh, 1,200 people watching live right now. So if you have a question, go to Twitter and tweet pound no, uh, hashtag node summit. Uh, with your question, and we'll uh, ask it to Jason. He's a guru, CTO, co-founder, entrepreneur, very successful, knows the space cold. First question comes in is, why so many DevOps tools are written in Node.js? Uh, well, no Node is basically purpose-built for those types of things. I mean, we made it so that one could easily create servers that talk a specific protocol, that function as an API endpoint, to do sort of data ingress, egress, and a lot of the sort of DevOps tools are fundamentally you having a server talk to another server, sending a message saying, do these following things, um, and um, you know, Node's very good at writing that type of infrastructure. So Node does not allow blocking calls, but nope. hackers love it. So why is non-blocking and blocking, what's the issue? Can you just break down the, I mean, I kind of know why, I just want you to, to answer it in your words. Why is the non-blocking thing such a big deal? versus um, blocking calls. It, it, it really comes down to if, um, blocking things basically have to consume a thread or a process per connection. Um, and so what you end up doing is you end up having um, frameworks and language stacks becoming connection bound. You know, and if you're supposed to connect to a million things, um, and if you can do that with one node process, or if you have to do that with 500 Java processes, you know, that, that is a big difference, and that, that, that's fundamentally where the difference comes in. Okay, the next question that, uh, well, I got this earlier. Should yeah. a novice developer learn Node.js or Rails? Uh, well, they're different. I mean, Node.js Node is using JavaScript, and so, you know, Node.js is, is a, um, a, 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 a runtime, a JavaScript runtime, really closer to PHP or Ruby or something else. And if you know JavaScript, you know Node. Um, and so that's, that's pretty, pretty sort of simple to do. Um, Rails is actually a very good way to write websites and web applications. Um, and that's actually uh, an MVC framework on top of, of Ruby. Um, and so in the case of Node, you know, there's things like Bootstrap and ExpressJS, and there's similar sort of frameworks built on Node to do something like Rails. But they're, they're two different things. Let's talk about the platform as a service market. Obviously, it's a hot category. I've blogged about this and tweeted about this. I feel it's a race to zero. Uh, if you want to be an entrepreneur and start one now, it's a lot of barriers to enter, and pri it's a price-sensitive market in some areas if you want to go pure pass. Yeah. At the same time, the, the value of uh, creations at the app level and there's a middleware opportunity. How does the marketplace evolve? You're in that business. And you know, in any good business, uh, simplicity and abstract yeah. abstracting away complexity is a goal. Yep. You've done that with Joint. You've extracted abstracted away complexity and it's, it's simple from what we're hearing so yeah. and what we're reporting so what is that opportunity for new entrepreneurs people that you're servicing because there'll be another Twitter coming out here we're going to try to talk to sure. Boxster who's going to uh, had a great chat with the, the folks last night oh yeah. Um, yeah great killer app it's doing great growing like crazy yep. what is that opportunity for value creation for the entrepreneurs out there in this yeah. past market because everyone wants to have a platform. That's the holy grail, right? So, but they really can't Well, get you know, the, the opportunity really is if you think, you know, in 2001, you know, there's maybe 200 million people on the internet. Um, and now, you know, applications like Facebook or Twitter, you know, are two and three times larger than that, right? Uh, and, you know, there's two billion people now using the internet and roughly half of those are accessing it on a mobile device. And if you start thinking around really good machine-to-machine -machine platforms, really good native mobile experiences, if you really begin to start looking around you know, machine data and those types of things, um, there's tremendous opportunities in those areas around mobile, mobile platforms, good machine-to-machine, -machine, you know, machine data, you know, machine learning, those types of things around it. Uh, and in fact, you know, things like machine-to-machine -machine and machine data um, that's actually a larger data set, potentially, than uh, what you would get in, say, user-generated data. 
And so, I um, I've been very supportive and and critical of Amazon over the years. Love Amazon. I think it represents the most fundamental shift we've seen from a computing, programming, developer environment. Mm -hmm. I've also called them the hardware store for developers. Sure. Uh, and when, when I really get crazy, I call them the junkyard of, of, uh, of computing, where you can just make anything you want, but you got to kind of put it together on your own. Yeah. What are the big trends around prefabricated code and kind of, uh, you know, New, new frameworks like Node, what is the uh, dynamics on the marketplace today that you're seeing the trends around making it easier, around coding, mm -hmm. deploying, and ultimately the scaling so a developer can have a million connections? What's sure. the dynamics? Well, I, I think in general it is around, you know, a lot of the things we get is around agility, flexibility, backward compatibility. Those are normal sort of desires. Um, but from a perfect infrastructure, what you also need is performance, scalability, resiliency, reliability. You need to understand sort of exactly what's going on when something goes wrong. Uh, you need it to be secure, meaning you need to prevent corruption. And you need to actually go and be able to sort of look at uh, integrity of things, whether something was corrupted. Uh, and there needs to be sort of a good elegance around accessing the data, interacting with it, interoperating with it. Uh, and integrating with that sort of infrastructure. And so I think in a lot of ways, we ha we're sort of taking from just the agility, flexibility, you know, testing development type things, and say, how do we actually move it so that, that this is the core way that we do um, our applications, and this is the core way that we run applications very, very well. Um, and when you start thinking around uh, that, you know, I have data, I need you to store my data good. I write apps that access that data and do things to that data. I need you to run my apps well. Great. Alex, I want, I want to ask two more questions and I'll let you have the floor. Okay. Uh, what is the most successful company that you, that's out there, uh, or most well-known <coughs> company that's, that's using Node in production? Um, well, geez, I mean, there's a, you know, I, I've been sort of surprised by, but it's, it's everyone. <laughs> LinkedIn? Uh, LinkedIn's Facebook. whole, uh, well, I don't know if they're, Facebook's using it in production, but you know, LinkedIn's mobile endpoints, uh, are now all in Node. They actually got a very good compression based on that. Um, you know, we had a, a good uh, article by Cade Metz and Wired yesterday talking about Sabre's use of Node.js, uh, you know, which Sabre does, I think, the only thing that does really more transactions per second than they do uh, is the New York Stock Exchange. And so, you know, being able to sit down and say, well, you know, we're, we're actually going to, um, you know, take you know, key API endpoints around, you know, all the, you know, um, airline registrations and reg reservations of the world and run that through. Um, we see a tremendous amount of use even within, you know, different types of uh, government agencies and I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Yeah. Congratulations, well, we're big fans of you guys. We love, we love Node. Uh, my final question is, and then I'll let Alex jump in because I know I've been, been uh, hogging the microphone. Um, we're at the beginning of the year, 2012. Yep. Um, looking back last year, what are you like most excited about what happened last year? What, what couple, couple things or one thing that you can look back last year and saying, man, I am so proud of what happened with Joyent. And then yeah. what's your goals this year for 2012? And don't give me the whole, I got a global, oh, come on, be specific, something personal. Uh, like last, well, I mean. Last I, year, I, what was the big thing you look back at the end of the year, have a cocktail, New Year's Eve? And, yeah. Well, I mean, November, November 28th, my third daughter was born. There you go. All so right. that, that was a that was a pretty good event. Congratulations. Thanks. Thanks. I have. Uh, How old are they? Uh, Eleven, two and a half, and um, and seven weeks old. Wow, you get your hands full. Yeah, and then joins the eight-year-old one. <laughs> soon is going to be public and out of the house, right? Uh, soon, close. How about yeah. this year? What's your goals this year? What's your uh, your? Uh, well, we're actually, I mean, we're, we're expanding, um, you know, ourselves, uh, you know, across about a dozen, a dozen data centers, uh, both in the U.S., Europe, and, and Asia-Pac ourselves. Uh, and then uh, for a lot of our larger infrastructure software customers, is just going in there and um, servicing their infrastructure well and capturing um, as much of their IT spend as we can. I mean, that's... that's <laughs> Revenue's that's, that's, good. Alex, so. I'm sorry about that. Talking all the uh, oh, it's the okay. Microphone. It's okay. Here we are. And I'm gonna. I, I just so. have I just have one question. Um, yeah. I'm curious about that differentiator between you and Amazon Web Services, and and I was learning a little bit about your data visualization tools. Can you talk about that and how that serves as a differentiator for you? Uh, yeah, I mean we 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 have a pretty unique ability to look at um, any aspect of the entire system across all of our data centers. 
um, you know, in real time, in production, without a production impact. Um, and so that sort of ability to go through and say exactly what's going on um, at any sort of point in time, not just in aggregate, but even on individual type events. Um, and most importantly, when people sort of come to us and say, why is something slow? We can tell them exactly why it's slow. They can say, why, this is, why isn't this working? We can tell them exactly why it's working. And that sort of general um, insight means that, you know, when you deal with, with, with the way that, that we do infrastructure, um, you know, Okay, we're back live in San Francisco, California for the Node Summit. We're here at uh, probably one of the most progressive developer uh, events, uh, business events around Node and Node.js. Uh, but really we're talking about uh, all the recent advancements around the web, Web 2.0, Web 3.0, whatever you want to call it. Um, and uh, we're excited by that. And we're here with Peter Chang, who's the CEO of Oxygen Cloud. Peter, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you, glad to be here. So tell us about Oxygen Cloud and what you guys are doing right now in your company. Give us a quick background, then we'll jump into some specific questions. Okay, uh, let me give you a kind of high level and then uh, talk about the background. So uh, what Oxygen uh, provides, uh, what we offer is a platform for companies to give their employees cloud storage services. The twist here is that they can use their own uh, storage. So uh, storage hardware that they've already invested in, uh, that they have experience uh, managing, uh, stuff that they control, um, and uh, can, uh, uh, can uh, gain assurances on in terms of security and uptime. Um, so it's giving them the cloud without losing control. Uh, is, is, is in essence what we're um, providing. And what's the status of the company? Where are you guys at in terms of funding and uh, size, employees? Yeah. So I founded the company in 2000, uh, actually last year. Uh, so we've been running for uh, a year. The product was uh, released, um, the first cut of it was in uh, June uh, of last year. So we've got about two quarters worth of, uh, worth of activity. Um, the company is privately funded. We're about 30 uh, people. Uh, and uh, uh, we're gaining really strong traction. So the marketplace is um, really being driven by the uh, uh, iPad adoption and the uh, uh, the uh, acceptance of um, iPads in the enterprise and people looking for how they can leverage iPad uh, as a productivity tool. Which has some interesting implications, doesn't it? I mean, in terms of what kind of serp or what kind of solution you offer, as I, you know, as, as we know, you have a partnership with EMC. Yes. And tell us about the virtual appliances that you're that you're integrating right now, and and what are you what what are you kind of seeing from from customers? as a result of installing that type of appliance? Yeah, so the typical customer that comes to us uh, starts off with a question of, we've got iPads, uh, they're in the enterprise, people are bringing them to the uh, on-premise, uh, and data is going onto these devices. They've asked us, how do we support iPad? How do I get access to my work content from my iPad? And um, IT doesn't have a ready answer, so they come to us. Um, with that, uh, basically, how do we sync and share this content uh, on the iPads? Um, EMC is a very strong partner uh, in, in that space. Uh, they've, um, uh, they are in, of course, it's a, it's a major storage company. And they're uh, in, involved with um, all the leading companies that are out there. Uh, and what, the, what we provide with them is what we've developed is a, a joint solution uh, using Oxygen as the connector, as the front end, and EMC storage as the back end. We're able to give uh, enterprises the ability to roll out these services for uh, access on their iPads, on their iPhones, and on desktop devices. So on the, compare and contrast the, obviously the hot companies out there on the consumer side yeah. are BoxNet, Box.net, Dropbox, People, consumers know those. How, how do you guys compare, just for the folks out there who aren't familiar with Oxygen, how do you compare, because those guys are pumping up a lot of hype, Box.net yeah. is out there saying that they're enterprise, cloud, what does that mean and how do you guys compare? Yeah, we have uh, similar features. So I think the market um, sees that and, and wonders what's the, what's the difference. Um, fundamentally, uh, the big difference is in our approach. 
So a box uh, takes a web portal approach um, to how you uh, share information. Um, Dropbox is a synchronization service. How do you sync all these devices uh, with S3 as the uh, back-end storage? Oxygen really acts more as a hub, as a hub connecting devices, on-premise storage uh, together and linking that all into one seamless system. So you can get that uh, seamless ac anywhere access to content, but without giving up any of your controls. So on um, storage, obviously storage is a big part of EMC's business and mm -hmm. companies. Um, explain this on-premise cloud solution you mentioned, because you have similar features or box, but you're also on-premise. What does that all mean? Yeah, um, so the way our solution works with, uh, with EMC is we support EMC Atmos, which is the um, object-based uh, storage product. We also support VNX um, and Isilon, uh, which are uh, mm -hmm. more traditional mm -hmm. uh, network uh, storage devices. Right. Um, the way a solution gets deployed is we would drop in a virtual appliance that right. would sit on premise in front of this uh, storage uh, infrastructure that already exists and connect that into the cloud. Yeah. And by that, that appliance acts as a bridge to connect into the Oxygen cloud service, which all the devices are connected to, and we broker access to that storage. How is the identity managed? Yeah, that's a great question. The um, Oxygen is, is all about uh, giving you the abilities of the cloud without compromising your control. So a big part of control is how you define who users are. Uh, in a typical enterprise, there's an LDAP or Active Directory uh, system. Uh, we sit in front of that with a federated uh, gateway. Um, so when a user says, hey, I'm Joe, I want access to this space, we would ask that device, ask that uh, service, which would then consult with the on-premise um, uh, AD directories and mm -hmm. tell us, okay, this is Joe, and we would give him access. So in that way, enterprise is controlling not only the storage and the content, but also the identities. These are the key elements to controlling access. So you can, you can follow the same security protocols that you would normally. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, and, and that's what's so what's been so attractive is that uh, what companies today, when they think about supporting iPad, they're sort of faced with this choice of you know the current solution is just to push it all into the cloud, mm -hmm. just upload it into uh, the uh, cloud storage uh, application and kind of wash your hands of it and, and, and walk away. That's not very attractive for no. uh, obvious uh, reasons. So. We give them a bridge. We provide companies with a way to offer those services without throwing away all their existing investments and, and controls. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that approach that we take is, again, a hub that acts sort of as this uh, super connector uh, with user devices, storage, active directory, content repositories, all plugging into this one system. How is it integrated with a tablet device or a mobile device? Yeah. Um, is it, do you guys have apps that you yep. offer? So we have our own um, Oxygen uh, application on iPad, um, iPhone, Android. Uh -huh. uh, but we also support um, WebDAV as a protocol. So you can get uh, to content, say, from your Keynote or from your Quick Office, uh, which is a, a, another partner of ours, uh, to open up Word documents, edit it, and save it right back into storage. So creating that complete loop. Uh, around uh, access to content, um, not only getting to it, but pushing it back into the enterprise. I see. So what have you seen in terms of device, <coughs> devices and device management issues over the past year that companies are coming to you with and when they're trying to figure out how to manage just any kind of data that their, that their users come across, either developing themselves or ingesting from a third party or from a mm -hmm. team inside the company? Right, it's the, so a, a big part about the iPad um, a, a adoption is that it's tied up with this whole trend of bring your own device. Right. And that creates a big problem for uh, companies in that when somebody leaves, you can't ask them for that device back to get rid of, uh, get rid of that data, right. data. So this endpoint control extending to tablets and to iPhones, um, ability to control the content that's going in there without actually controlling the physical device is a big deal. So we offer that um, as well. Uh, all the data that is coming into the iPad uh, through uh, Oxygen uh, is uh, stored in an encrypted state, still access controlled by uh, the Active Directory and by central uh, wow. admins. So a company can give that data to an iPad, but 
they can be assured that all that content is, it re remains under their control. So if somebody were to leave the company, for example, you don't have to worry about getting that iPad. You can just turn off their access and uh, remove the content. Right. So, so you can essentially just cut the cord. Yeah, you can just cut the cord. So this is a security Can model. you wipe it then too? Uh, you will also be able to wipe it. We, we don't have that capability yet, but that will be rolling but out very if soon. If they did that, they'd be wiping the entire device. No, and that's actually a, a, a big distinction. Um, that uh, uh, that's actually what happens today is that when a company say right uh, when you get when you link your iPad to um, your enterprise right uh, the the deal is we can remote wipe the entire thing if it's right. lost, which is not a good thing. That, I mean, that, that's led to actually some litigation. Some some litigation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so we approach it at a much more granular level. Right. Right. We control the security model is around the content rather than around the device. Right. And this allows us to, to uh, gain much more control uh, over all of that information, but also uh, support many, many more devices in a more fluid way, which is how users want to be able to uh, uh, you know, access uh, IT these days. So tell me who your users are these days. Like who, how would you break them down? Our, we offer two uh, services. One is a pro cloud and the other is an enterprise cloud. Mm -hmm. The pro cloud is targeted for teams and enterprise cloud is for company-wide um, deployment. Right. So our users run the entire uh, gamut, mostly in the executive ranks. Because the when, uh, when employees bring their iPad, their brand new shiny iPad to work and say, I want to be able to use this to access my content, oftentimes that's the CEO. Right. And so we see adoption driving yeah. actually from the top, which is very different from how it's traditionally done, sort of rounds up you know, from uh, the fringe departments. Right. Um, and, but the usage of it is pretty broad. Uh, right. Every group needs it. This is a horizontal problem, right? Everybody needs access to content, and they want to do it uh, in this new style, um, and uh, that's what we support. It's interesting how s something had such a, something has such an impact on the company because the CEO has decided to adopt it. <laughs> right. Uh, I mean, I, it makes sense, but it's just, just fascinating how quickly that can happen. Yeah. The enterprise business is, you know, it's a fickle business. The consumer business is different, right? I mean, Box.net is really, I mean, I've said it's a consumer company and a couple guys put their credit card down and they're now an enterprise client cause they, just because they work there. And they're trying to be more enterprise. You have a dedicated sales force. Um, Whitney, um, who's been on the Cube, talked about their strategy mm -hmm. at Box. They're all about sharing and it all sounds great and all. Um, but IT in the enterprise ha is about stability. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to talk about two things, um, one, the requirements of those enterprises, yep. okay, and two, the explosion of new requirements that are driving their use cases, like mobile. We mentioned iPad. You mentioned the usage of iPad. So obviously Salesforce, business analytics, uh, EMC, you mentioned as a partner, they're big on big data meets cloud. So now you have connected devices mm -hmm. in the enterprise. Mm -hmm. So, you know, business line managers are saying, hey, I want some of that cloud, but I also want certain requirements like security, stability, production systems. Yeah. Can you just t talk about those two things? Yeah. Um, the, the way I would think about all of this is that as the, uh, you know, we know that iPad is uh, making profound changes for regular users. Uh, this PC is no longer the center of the universe. You've got lots of devices, and that's changing how people consume. But what we don't really see, and what we're seeing a lot of now, we're recognizing, is that a lot of what IT's uh, strategies uh, and, and um, uh, investments are around is, is centered around the PC. Controlling data and providing access, is, it's all PC-centric. Um, and that's no longer working. So that's driving a lot of change. So the customers that we're the, uh, talking with um, they're re-examining everything. How do we fundamentally control security? How do we fundamentally deal with offering, um, uh, competing with consumer services, right? How do we uh, offer these new style uh, applications um, while still doing their jobs, which is governance, uh, IT governance, maintain control, maintain compliance, keep uh, control costs, uh, et cetera. Um, this is where oxygen really shines, is that our approach right from the beginning was, was to create a service that was flexible, that can be dropped into uh, enterprise, help them sort of adopt this new, uh, uh, all the, the, the new technologies, but with, in a way that isn't 
um, so disruptive uh, to them that they got to give everything, uh, give everything up. So uh, as they're thinking about what they, uh, what they uh, need to do, I think a new model is essentially forming uh, around how you deal with enterprise um, security around enterprise content, around devices, relationship uh, with users. I think that change is um, going to be just as profound as personal computing and probably take a few, uh, few years to, to play through. And the first steps there are how do we support these uh, end user devices uh, in the uh, corporate environment effectively. What's the number one use case that you guys are seeing that takes advantage of Oxygen? Is there any one trend that you say this is a use case that we are absolutely focused on initially uh, in terms of getting that market position? Mm -hmm. um, and what is that and what are some of the things that you're hearing? Yeah, the, the very first case, uh, the, the big use case for us, and I think the, the big first use case when, we, when enterprises start thinking about the iPad is how do they get access to enterprise content? Uh, from this new device, from this new, uh, from this new medium. Um, it could be content that they want to access because they're in the field. You know, I'm a pharmaceutical sales rep, I've got lots of literature. Instead of lugging around big bags for, uh, worth of paper, I can carry around my iPad and get the latest um, brochure and sales information directly on my iPad. We see a lot of that field enablement um, as an like, uh, initial uh, push. Um, we see uh, in the executive ranks, um, this idea that um, we don't have to carry big bulky laptops or even thin laptops uh, around anymore, that we can carry all of our uh, information uh, with us on our smartphones or on our uh, tablets, uh, be able to jump into a meeting um, and be productive uh, right away. Mark Hopkins and I, the editor of SiliconAngle.com, and I were talking about um, probably the most popular story on SiliconANGLE uh, this week is the mega upload. Obviously, Node Sum is driving a lot of popularity today, but um, you know, the mega upload has been a shot across the bow as, as you, you and I were talking before mm -hmm. you came on about, you know, these cloud-based consumer sites where, yep. you know, there's a lot of SOPA-related kind of entertainment rights issues. Um, and that's a challenge for the box.nets of the world and other, other folks, Dropbox. Is your on-prem solution take care of that? And how do, you, how do you dance around this new trend that's mm -hmm. pretty obviously disrupting business models of these guys? Yeah. Um, so our, our service is clearly geared at uh, companies uh, that want to deploy um, cloud storage and, and support all these uh, new devices. Um, and um, our, our product, our services, our support, our sales are all uh, familiar to the enterprise um, uh, customer. So when, uh, and this is a big uh, important distinction because what they are competing against, what the enterprise is often competing against are consumer services uh, that are, are grabbing their users and their data is being sucked into these environments uh, where you got issues with is the, is the data really there? How much control do you have? What happens when uh, somebody makes a SOPA claim or uh, makes a claim that uh, you, know, you are pirating data? What happens to all of that? So our solution insulates our customers uh, from, these, uh, from these issues. Uh, this is a pure business um, service. The data is not commingled with uh, say, uh, some kid uploading uh, their uh, uh, music or their um, uh, video. Um, the content uh, is controlled within your own company. Uh, it's not used by anybody else. So that cl draws the lines clearly so that there's no ambiguity in terms of uh, what the usage of the data is for. When a customer asks you about your business model, how do you mm -hmm. explain oxygen to them? When they say, okay, what is your business? What business are you in? How should they, what, what, is your, what is your story to them? Yeah, um, there is what we do today and what we started the company trying uh, to do. So when I founded the company, um, when I started the company last year, we started with uh, a couple of, of, of major sort of key beliefs. Uh, one is uh, about the mobile and how that is changing uh, the user's relationship with uh, their device. And the other is how the enterprise uh, needs to react to that. And, and that there are great opportunities to leverage these new devices to create more productivity, to create more um, innovation, and be more um, be more agile. Um, providing access, mobile access to storage, that's our first step. That's the first service that we're uh, we're offering uh, to uh, move um, the companies in, in that uh, direction. But we have a whole pipeline uh, of products uh, that will be uh, coming out. Uh, we are in the business of making companies successfully adopt the cloud. That's 
fundamentally uh, what, we're, um, what, what we're geared uh, to doing is how do you use companies take advantage of all of these new changes uh, to improve their businesses and to increase their ability to control their environment. Is the challenge a user interface challenge or is it a technical challenge or both? It's all of the above. Um, I think the cloud is, um, the cloud is so awesome because it doesn't look at, it's, it's, it's awesome and it's gaining lots of traction because it fundamentally doesn't look at one aspect of the problem. It looks at the entire uh, ecosystem. It looks at the entire stack of, uh, of, 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 of issues. Um, and uh, so in order to effectively execute a new solution for the cloud, you've got to look at all of the above. So it's not only the user interface, because it clearly has to be very, very easy for users to uh, accept and to, uh, and to adopt, but it also uh, needs to be very intelligent. It needs to be very network aware and be able to plug in and connect with everything else uh, that's going on to uh, create this uh, effect. We're here with Peter Chang, the CEO of Oxygen Cloud, inside the Cube, our flagship telecast. We go out to the events, talk to the smartest people we can, share that knowledge with you. Uh, my final question is around what's next. Obviously, you're the CEO of a growing company. Mm -hmm. You founded it, you're the founder, CEO. Um, it's hard to do startups. You're always kind of innovating and, and trying to keep pace with the business. What are your big challenges um, as you head the company up and going forward this year and, and looking out the next five years? What's, your, what's on your mind and what are your key challenges and opportunities? Yeah, um, uh, the key challenge uh, for me is, is, uh, uh, is about maintaining that uh, focus on the future. Because I think oftentimes you um, uh, launch a product and you get sucked up into what's happening today right now and you lose the ability to actually create that breakthrough, that innovation. So preserving that forward-looking uh, innovation is, is uh, the, bi the big challenge. The big opportunity for us is I think uh, clearly this is happening over the next one, two years that everything is going to change, that the cloud is going to become a significant uh, content repository. There's a, uh, a significant way that we interact with all of our uh, information. Um, and Oxygen seeks to be the platform that, uh, that bridges now into that, uh, into that future. That I would define our success as, uh, in, in a couple of years, that a large percentage of the world's corporate information is flowing through the Oxygen um, cloud. Mm. That's I, our I, goal. I've heard that as much as 40% of cloud spend will be on storage. Is that accurate? Uh, I think that is the, I'm not sure if it's accurate, but that is uh, the biggest uh, immediate uh, usage of cloud. Yeah. Right. That if you so look at the not forty percent, it's leading. It's a it's a huge part. And yeah. I think if you look at Amazon spending, you'll see that S three store uh, is generating a, a significant part uh, of the uh, consumption. So I'd have, I'd have one recommendation: stay in the storage business. That's what I would say. Stay in the storage <laughs> business. All right. <laughs> well, the summit, this uh, the event here is all about a lot of I O, real time web, and obviously collaboration and, mm -hmm. and leveraging data has been a big part of what we've been doing at Silicon Angle, and that's storage. I mean, it's a storage, depending on where you want to put the storage, it sits yeah. some ways on-prem and in the cloud, it has some economical benefits, um, but it's a constant challenge to maintain you know, the regulatory, you know, the, the mm -hmm. auditing. I mean, what's that look like for you guys? Is it, is it a mess? Is it, is it easy to deal with? I and mean, it's already probably not easy, you guys make it easier, but how do you guys talk to customers around the notion of compliance and, and keeping their yeah. data, making it fresh, active data, but at the same time, yeah. you know, stable, secure, stable, and available. Yeah, um, that's actually a great story for us uh, to tell, because as a side effect of putting stuff into oxygen, um, you actually know, you begin to know everything. You begin to know where all your content is, who's accessing, what, what, is, what it is, how often is it's used. That allows you to drive compliance reporting requirements, that allows you to compliance, drive uh, ways to reduce storage costs, because you know uh, what's uh, real important storage, what, um, uh, what isn't. Uh, contrast this with traditional storage, which is file sitting on file servers. You don't really know, right? Stuff goes onto file servers, and file servers never die, and you never know uh, when you can take that thing down, and you don't know what's happening in it. So um, it's sort of a little counterintuitive, but putting in a cloud approach to, to file storage, to, to content, actually ups your, your visibility, ups your ability to uh, understand what's going on for compliance reasons, for governance uh, reasons. And analytics and, for business management, right? And absolutely for, uh, for analytics. So storage is the beginning point because everything centers around content. Uh, but what happens as you go forward is how do you drive more capabilities, either features or uh, solutions uh, on top of the storage that you're capturing. 
Okay, Peter Chang, CEO of Oxygen Cloud. Thanks for coming on theCUBE. Thanks for coming up and visiting us here at Node Summit. And uh, we really look forward to uh, covering you guys. Hot startup, uh, Oxygen Cloud, founder, CEO, Peter Chang. We'll be right back in five minutes. First time on theCUBE, baby. Rock and roll. I think it's probably five or six times I've been on the Cube now. Right, and, you know, at first, the guys are just fun to work with. Pat, welcome back. Hey, always a pleasure to be in the Cube. <laughs> hey, I'm about to go on the Cube. You never know what's going to happen. I'm uh, a three-time veteran of being on the Cube. Uh, I hope many, many more. Chad Sackets, Chad, welcome to the Cube. Dave, John, it's great to be here, man. I keep coming back because uh, great, insightful questions from, uh, from uh, John and from Dave. What face-melting action have you seen here at the event? And I know there's a lot of it. It's a great vehicle to, uh, to communicate with a broad audience that a lot of folks watch. Great to have you back. Good job. All right, Craig Nunez, uh, VP of Marketing at HP Storage. Thanks very much for coming on theCUBE. Yeah. When people mention theCUBE, they, they're like, oh my God, I saw you on theCUBE. And they're all excited about it. It's, it's, a, it's an experience. It's not just information. They experience kind of what's going on there. It's like real time. It's like they were there. That was like my going to the pleasure. gym. Boom, boom. Legendary IBMer, CEO of Symantec, and now CEO of Virtual Instrument. Uh, great to have you on theCUBE. So for CUBE to be here at a conference like this that's got 15, 20,000 people and sharing that live around the world, that's consistent with the way the, the world is evolving. So it's a wonderful media, wonderful media. John and Dave are amazing. I don't know how they keep everything in their heads the way they do. Uh, it's a great format and we're obviously seeing that this notion of real-time coverage and a real conversation is what's driving us as a company. And I, I said very seriously, when the questions and the comments that we hear from from them and from all the different guests here directly turn into the products that we build. Yeah, that was my first Cube and uh, I really enjoyed it. There was the rapid fire of questions. It made me think on my feet, but they were very thought provoking and really got me going on analyzing the, the greatness of Arista and the greatness of the Cube as well. John and Dave, the reason their approach works, they're not just guys you know, reading down the question list, right? Okay, next one, next one. They're, they're, it's a conversation, right? And it's, you know, they're going to challenge you. They're not going to say, for the, the marketing hype and the BS and all that stuff that the industry throws around. Come on, you got to hit him up on the HP question. A lot's changed at HP, some turmoil at the top, obviously, controversy. They're going to hold you down to the, the, the real facts, compare you to the choices our users have, and have you respond to it on the spot, right? Thinking real time, and so that's real talk, not just uh, kind of a paper interview, I think. I'm John Furrier with SiliconAngle.com, and I'm here with Dave Vellante. We are inside the Cube. The Cube is our flagship telecast. We go out to the events, extract all the signal from the noise, and share that with you. And great guest lineups. We've got CEOs, CTOs, with all the top executives, bloggers, thought leaders, venture capitalists. I'm absolutely stunned by because I know it demands 100% attention for these guys to be up there talking to people about a wide variety of technology topics. I can't believe these guys can make it so many days in a row. So I'm wondering how long they're going to go home and pass out for after this. But it was incredible, they, they just do a fantastic job. If you're not having a conversation, then you're very scripted. And if you're scripted, then you might be getting the right words, but you're often not getting the whole meaning and the whole depth of the conversation to the fullest extent. I think this is a heck of a lot more authentic. It comes straight from the heart and the brain. Sometimes you might forget to make some of your points if you're not a real-time thinker. But I think from both from a participation and from a consuming point of view, it's much more real. Chris holds no punches. So I've been on a cube uh, a number of times, and I think that the interesting thing about, the, the, about being in that particular venue in that format, they introduced me as, hey, I, hey, Hoff doesn't pull punches. Well, they don't either, right? They ask really difficult, uncomfortable questions sometimes, and you can tell people uh, and the positions and where they are uh, in terms of what they're able or, or desirous to speak of, uh, you can tell where they are on that borderline between kind of just, you know, a honestly answering questions versus kind of glossing over them, and I, I enjoy being there because I, I don't want to say I'm outspoken, but I 
honestly answer questions uh, with, with the full intent of being able to be um, respectful to the people that I, I bring solutions to, right? If I whitewash this crap, you're gonna turn me off every single time you see me on, on, on any venue, let alone, let alone the Cube. So I, I like being asked tough questions, I like answering them honestly, and that's a fantastic venue for doing it. Otherwise you get on panels and you got a bunch of talking heads blabbing at each other and it's worthless. Yeah, this was my first time on theCUBE, and um, I really got a chance to get to know John and Dave, and, and they're really amazing guys. I mean, the, the knowledge that they come with, um, the topics that they could talk about, the people that they know, and just bringing it all together in this live broadcasting forum is just fantastic. I mean, I just love it. I'm like, I feel like a groupie or something, you know? <laughs> in, in this environment, you know, the social environment, the real-time environment where we're in, right, people look through the marketing fluff very quickly, and if it's not authentic, right, you know, they don't trust it anymore. So in this environment, I think it's a growing trend. Yeah. Founder of SiliconAngle.com, SiliconAngle. Okay, we're back inside the Cube, our flagship telecast. We go out to the events, cover it like a blanket, talk to the smartest people we can find, entrepreneurs, thought leaders, entrepreneurs in residence, venture capitalists, big executives, and, uh, and have some fun and share that knowledge with you. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconAngle.com, and I'm here with Todd Papianu. Todd P, Good or work. at Dr. Lucky Spin. Okay, how do I get your last name again? It's just Papianu. Papianu. Simple. Okay, butcher that one. But anyway, Todd, uh, legend at Yahoo, ran the cloud group over there, now is an entrepreneur in residence. Uh, alpha geek, um, doing a startup, it's in stealth. He won't say anything about it, he's been tight-lipped. Uh, and also good friends with Bruno from Yahoo, who's going to be on theCUBE at two o'clock here. So uh, come back at, uh, you know, two, at three o'clock, I'm sorry, uh, to, to talk to uh, Bruno from Yahoo. So Todd, uh, big data is your thing. Large scale web, mm -hmm. Node.js, this is in your wheelhouse. So first of all, uh, share with the folks out there your impression of Node and the momentum it has and you know, Joy in taking advantage of that with uh, their financing and growth. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think Node's been uh, one of the most exciting things from my standpoint anyway, going on in uh, delivering you know, the next wave of you know, rich, personalized web applications and really enabling uh, us as technologists and developers to to really focus on a different way of building applications. I think you know the, the wave that we see over the next decade as it unfolds will be you know, all around this kind of like real time, you know, uh, node enabled applications on devices out there in the networking, then on the backside there'll be obviously you know, cloud and big data applications sitting in the server uh, infrastructures in the cloud. So I wrote a tweet uh, prior to coming here that node is the gateway drug to uh, you know, big data or gateway drug to you know, Hadoop and, and then this large scale analytical systems, which is not really, it's kind of apples and oranges, but in a way you have you know, front end developer becoming a little bit more back end like in mm -hmm. terms of capabilities, and also with, with big data you have a whole different set of challenges. It's still related to real time, but not necessarily the same thing. Um, is that true? Do you see it that way? And, and obviously big data takes advantage of analytics in, in a real time fashion, mm -hmm. although handled differently. How are those two worlds coming together? the big data space, essentially large scale, which is the DevOps world, and, mm -hmm. and, and this node trend. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think those trends are all related. So the, the way I look at it is, uh, you know, I, I think the cloud and big data are the two mega trends of, in IT of this decade. And clouds are, you know, a way of you know, deploying applications on top of, uh, you know, elastic infrastructure. And there's going to be big cloud providers, a bit like the power utility companies. 
Uh, you know, above that, I think you know the most interesting things that's going to be going on for the next decade will be. Uh, you know, big data applications, right? Big data applications and fabrics are the next generation middleware. And so then when you actually get out to where the consumer is, right, that's where Node comes in, right? Mobile is, a, you know, is a trend for how we deliver much richer uh, user experiences to, uh, to people on myriad devices. And so where Node is really taken off, I think, is that it really allows you to uh, focus on that application, focus in having a way more connections open, you know, so you can actually be pumping real-time data back and forward. And so I think that, you know, Node and big data and, you know, the, the real-time web and, you know, continuous business intelligence is, is actually going to be one of the, you know, the kind of like key trends that we see in this environment, you know, going forward. All of us guys who are part of the, what I call web 1.0 crowd, you know, guys <laughs> who were doing some work, uh, you know, in the, in the early 90s and mid-90s around the web, you know, that was cool. And then, you know, the bubble burst. But a lot of those things we talked about in the, in the year 2004 time frame, they all kind of came true after the bust. Mm -hmm. um, web web 2.0 is kind of the same thing. Do you see it the same way where you know, Web 2.0 came out, it was all about Ajax, but wasn't really, that wasn't really kind of the whole thing. This is more Web 2.0-ish than anything, right? I mean, you're seeing apps as an explosion, HTTP protocol kind of being mm -hmm. kind of a key driver here. I mean, is it, do you see the same thing? Yeah, I mean, I think HTTP has been a key driver. I think, you know, when Web 2.0 first came out and people were talking about Ajax applications, it was really, you know, the move from static pages that, you know, you had the render refresh cycle every time you hit the reload button. Ajax allowed you to have much more interactive applications, but they were still really kind of like in the browser, right? I think now, you know, with the uh, the explosion, you know, here in, in the US, right, which is obviously a little bit behind the rest of the world, right, with mobile devices and actually real mobile phones or cell phones, I suppose, as we should call them over here, that I can actually do something useful, you know, and, and like these things here, the iPhones are basically like transformed, you know, how people are delivering applications. Uh, and so I think that, you know, we needed those platforms and those ecosystems to emerge before we could actually get to uh, the type of, you know, future that we're looking at now. Right? And so I do think that Node and, you know, Big Data and Cloud are these three, you know, big old trends that are going to be driving through corporate IT and, you know, consumer IT for the next decade. How do you see the systems game changing? I mean, we've been talking about this in SiliconANGLE and within Wikibon, our analyst group, around the notions of systems uh, changing. And, and you know, Heroku, I mean, not Heroku, Joint throws around you know, the operating system that they're offering for free. Mm -hmm. um, but it changes the notion of operating system. You know, when you have disparate parts like this with a messaging component with real-time streaming, et cetera, it gets very messaging, you get a bus, you this, and you know, subsystems, blah, blah, blah. That's an operating system. So, you know, you've been that back end, you've seen some big machinery mm -hmm. at Yahoo. Mm -hmm. What's your take on this whole discussion around the modern data center operating system, the cloud operating system? I mean, I think the trend is happening, you know. I mean, I think, you know, one of the things, when I, when I talk about cloud out in public, I, I have this slide, and I put it up, and it's a black and white picture, and it's an IBM 360. And I'll show it up and be like, okay, anybody know what this is? You know, and then you see a few oh. Dale Grays in the crowd yeah, who get it. Yeah, yeah. But look, that was a mainframe, right? Yeah, yeah, but the yeah. ideas behind the mainframe are you know, really back, right? You know, when you talk about you know, distributed operating systems or job sharing or at least elasticity or chargeback and messaging you know, substrates, they were all there. All we've done is figured out how to do it at a much larger scale with lower cost commodity hardware you know, and blow it out, right? So the, the unit of failure is smaller. Uh, we, you know, Technology and many things is cyclical, so we're going through a lot of the same learning lessons again. I think that you know, people who are now retired would look back on and go, "Yeah, we solved those like 30 years ago," but but they solved it in a different environment. Yeah, the, yeah. the key difference was their environment was tightly controlled, you know, uh, inside the firewall, you know, very very uh, easier to manage. For us, what we're trying to do is solve these problems uh, on the web, right? And that is a you know wild wild west <laughs> place, right? Where you know there's all sorts of uh, you know network problems or connectivity problems or disparate devices uh, out there. And so, trying to deliver unified, consistent services and applications and experiences across this myriad of devices out there is a challenge. And so, that's where I think that you know the 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 idea of you know, the cloud OS and, you know, the cloud programming model such as Node comes into play. Let me ask you a question around the big whales in the industry, obviously, you know, Microsoft, mm -hmm. Google, Apple, um, VMware, we'll call them a whale because they have some market mm -hmm. power. Um, even SAP on the enterprise side, you have these guys, they're Oracle, Oracle. obviously huge, you know? Right. Um, they all got different approaches. What's, how's the game shake up for all those horses on the track? I mean, I'll say different approaches. Oracle fully integrated, Oracle, you know, it's Sun with 
volume. Yeah, it's it's. Yeah. I mean, it's a great question. You know, if you looked at a couple of years ago, you looked at you know these people's strategies like IBM, like HP. They were definitely you know showing the strategic way was to have a fully integrated vertical stack and a services business. Right? And Oracle have been doing the same thing. I think Oracle is highly interesting. I'm obviously I'm a big data guy, right? So you know, it's a little sidebar. You know, last week or the week before they announced their new kind of like you know big data Hadoop appliance. I think it's kind of interesting. With Cloud Air, ironically. With Cloud Air, exactly. Mike Olson so, has history with Oracle. He, he does, but the most interesting thing, and a little nod to my friend uh, Peter Goldmaker here, who kind of like put this up in the conversations. Don't you think it's ironic that you know Oracle have released a big data appliance where all they're providing is the hardware and not the database software, right? The world's largest database yeah. company on the planet. So. You know th this wave that's happening, uh, of which you know I'm excited to be a part of, right? With uh, with my new company is yeah, with is Oracle super signals exciting. that they're going to unbundle their core jewel. Mm -hmm. I wonder how you know uh, how many uh, bitter pills Larry had to swallow to uh, to get to let that one. I think go they out pulled the that when he was sailing. He was out. They pulled the <laughs> Maybe they back, did. Someone got so fired. Sign this. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Option to acquire Cloudera in that deal. Uh, Something must have got done. I don't know. It's yeah. a good, you know, I'm sure my buddy Almer is, uh, you know, hoping one day, you yeah. know. Uh, I mean, like you say, Mike has a track record with uh, yeah. with Oracle, so probably knows them well. But look, I think uh, I think the the big data market as it unfolds over the next couple of years is going to be highly interesting. Let's talk about the big data market. So, like, obviously, the big whales are big, and they don't move very fast. So you can kind of see their moves. Mm -hmm. You watch them closely, and we do. Um, let's talk about some of the uh, big data whales. Cloudera, mm -hmm. and then you got the uh, Horton Works going toe to toe, and a fast set follower trying to get second place locked in on that Apache side. Map R, um, other approaches. Flip yeah, I mean, I think mean? it's interesting that you would describe it that way because I kind of look at those guys and don't think they're the big whales yet. Maybe in the small pond that they're in, but the, the small big whales pond. are still people like Oracle and EMC, you know, and yeah. Microsoft, right? I mean, you know, those guys when they want to plow in like 200 developers onto a project, they can do it no problem, yeah. right? You know, uh, so I do think that you know. Yeah, so in the so in the minnow in the the minnows, right? <laughs> or the whales in the small pond, the startup community, which is right. you know, now the valuations are significantly higher. Cloudera just did a round of financing. I've mm -hmm. uh, got some fresh ca cabbage there. Yeah. Hortonworks has got the PR thing going on full throttle. Map bars going all in on that approach. I see EMC connection there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, is there's that, a, is that a race to there. be acquired? Is that is, is there conflicting approaches? I mean, is it the well, you know is an interesting uh, business, right? I mean, not all. When uh, and you know, the, the, I have friends that are both Cloudera and Hortonworks, right? But what, one of Hortonworks' goals is, uh, you know, half the world's data on Hadoop in five years. Now, you know, you got what to say, said, what half, of the, half of the world's data on Hadoop in five years, that's their goal. You think about that, whether it's Hortonworks or not, right? You think about, you know, the, the, the wave that Hadoop is pushing ahead of it, the bow wave, you know, there's a huge amount of innovation that can happen. Your question was, you know, is it uh, just a race to be acquired? You know, that's a great question. What, what I do know is, like, if those guys just stay down at the lower level, which is basically the plumbing and infrastructure, ultimately they'll get commoditized. You know, value's going to accrue further up the stack. So they need to move up, right? And other people need to be thinking further up. You can ride that bow wave, right? That's what we plan to do with my company. But, you know, you want to be a little bit further up the stack. Right? Yeah, yeah. And I know you keep teasing me about, you know, not giving out any details. So here, just for you, first off, yeah. I have, I'm transitioning out of battery now. You know, my AIR gig is coming to an end. Yeah. Uh, I've founded a new company called Continue. The C O N T N I T I N U U I T Y, and uh, you know we just uh, we just launched. We'll be announcing a few more details about um, you know funding and that uh, towards the end of the week. Uh, but, Continuity you know. launch here on the Cube. Mark Hopkins, we have news. <laughs> there you go. Okay, big data guru. Yeah. Todd, there you go. Dr. Lucky Spin is launching <laughs> Continuity. Announced at the end of the week. Um, I'm assuming the funders will be Battery Ventures leading the round? They're definitely in there, of course, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. That's kind of like the way a good EIR gig comes to an end, right? I'll rescind, you know? <laughs> me, I'll rescind my SiliconANGLE offer to you as our <laughs> chief big data Analyst. guest correspondent. Well, maybe I could be one of those guests. Well, you know, Sarah Palin made $10 million last year because she lost the presidency. So well, if you <laughs> want to come back as a commentator on the uh, big data, you know, if Fox the deal's 10 million in the year, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about that. So I totally agree. Going down, you know, if you want to get commoditized, it's a race to zero, right? So, okay, moving mm -hmm. up the stack um, is key. So is that middleware, orchestration, all these things are, what are some of the challenges in this marketplace that I, people are yeah. feeling the pain? I, I mean, I think, I think a lot, right? I mean, I think there's a lot. It's just once you've got the kind of like infrastructure and plumbing deployed, then what? If you want to build applications, right? Well, building applications on distributed systems or real-time distributed systems is super hard. So there's a whole focus on developers that I think is going to come. That, that's the natural next wave in, 
and big data. I think there's a lot of focus on visualization of the tools a la Tableau or Click, but for big data that needs to come to provide the tools to the business analysts out there. And so you're asking like, who are some of the, you know, maybe minnows in that pond? I, I think DataMirror are doing pretty well, right? You know, they obviously have a lead on the market. They got out there early. They have a tool that I think people are using. So they have a chance, right? You know, so there's a lot of great companies out there. Platform and DataMirror's got the experience right? on both sides too. They got the unstructured mm -hmm. and structured. They were at the, on the cube at Hadoop World. Um, yeah. They're, they're busy. They said they're growing like crazy. Yeah, Stefan's doing a great job there, I think. You know, so I, th I think there's a lot of really interesting companies in and around this space. Some in stealth I can't talk to you about. Some that, you know. So you're Hadoop-based, obviously. You mentioned Hadoop. Uh, we're in the Hadoop ecosystem, yes. Okay. And yeah, you, have, you have friends on all sides of the map there because of your, your I'm, role I'm trying Yahoo. to be Switzerland. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about Yahoo. We're going to have Bruno on later. I mean, Yahoo's got a new CEO. There's kind of a mess over there. And, and, but they're still a massively large company. They do a large scale. Um, talk about the Hadoop post Yahoo kind of deal that went down last year. I see Hortonworks, and not really a spin out, it was kind of more of a, everyone left and Yahoo got some equity and Benchmark funded it. Um, no, I wouldn't put it that way. It's definitely a spin out, right? I mean, we worked it internally, we put the deal together and spun, spun the company out and seeded it with some of the key talent from the Yahoo Hadoop team. You know, Benchmark did invest, um, Yahoo invested, you know, so I, you know, I, I don't think it was, uh, you know, it was a planned thing that we did, right? You know, and I, I think those guys are doing great. Yeah. You know, I expect good things from them this year. Yeah, and Aaron, uh, Arun, right? It's Arun? Ar Arun Murthy is one of the founders. Yeah. Eric's the CEO there. Yeah. Arun's on Twitter, great guy. Mm -hmm. Had great conversations with him. Um, they're authentic, they're straight up. Hey, we're, you know, we're going after Cloud Air because there's two, two seats at the table and we're happy to do that. Yeah, I, I think know? both of those companies actually need to keep an eye on the big boys. So that's what I've been kind of like, you know, whispering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, look out for EMC. You know, I mean, they have huge amount of resources to bring to bear. And they had right. record earnings, they got VMware. Right. Um, you know, right. MapR could be successful, it could be a dud, we'll see how that shakes out, but uh, obviously that's a challenge. Uh, so continuity. Mm -hmm. Orchestration. Well, here's, yeah. here, I, I gave you the scoop that something's coming out, but I do want to stay a little bit more in stealth about what we're doing yet. But um, So we're going to be announcing just the, the funding this week, and then um, I'm going to be at uh, the GigaOM structure event in New York in March and should be uh, announcing more then. So, you know, if you'd like, I can come back and tell you more then. Okay, so we have the scoop on Continuity, announcing their funding led by Battery Ventures um, and some other names which will be announced end of the week. Make sure we get that uh, press release. And, uh, Absolutely. Who's handling your PR? Oh, actually, uh, the battery PR battery guys are PR. doing it at the minute. Yeah. Yeah. So I got yeah. a need, um, note from Mike Dalbert. Good, good group over there. So as yeah. a, okay, so now that you're transitioning out of battery, you can tell us all their little secrets. So you sit in all these partner meetings and you go to these, uh, you know, the, look at all the startups. What's coming through? Um, and you don't need to un tell us any confidential information, but mm -hmm. just in general, what's the flow like at battery uh, in the VC circles coming through in terms of deal flow? So you look at the big data and kind of the web stuff. Uh, what are you seeing? In terms yeah, of lots. Deal flow? I mean, you know, I mean, I was I was kind of blown away when I first got there about the amount of stuff that's coming through. I mean, there was there was a huge amount of stuff in big data. Uh, obviously, right, you know, I started there in the summer, so, you know, that's when you know, everybody's just kind of like coming out of the woodwork, um, you know, looking for seed or kind of like first round funding, right? Mm -hmm. it's late stage, we didn't see a lot of, right? Um, there was a lot of cloud, right, but less so than I expected, right? You know, I really thought cloud was still going to be super big, but it seems like that first trend has come and gone, right, and we're going to wait for the next guys. Um, and I, I actually also spent a lot of time working with uh, the digital media practice, looking at digital media deals. Mm -hmm. So much more consumer-centric, consumer-focused stuff. Um, and some of that stuff there was like highly interesting, but for me, like I, I'm a kind of, you know, platform engine type guy, right? And I love that stuff, I love the interactivity, but yeah. I look at it and go, wow, you know, those are hits businesses, you know, maybe you're lucky in your Pinterest, but yeah, yeah, maybe yeah. you're not and you're like busy, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, you go away, so. Um, a you're a lot record of label at that point, you know. It's A&R, flow, and double down on Michael Jackson, you know, when you see him. Right, well, that isn't that <laughs> the VC business? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, know. I mean, a good engine, Can you, if you see a good, good IP, Right, right. Good platform. You say, okay, that's real. Right? Yeah, you can, you can yeah. see that. It's that's my that's my too. background. I, I, infrastructure, engines, platforms. That's you know my background. What I've done before at Yahoo, Teradata, and Greenplum. So what I enjoy you, that. Stuff. What do you think about all the social media world? Obviously, social media has evolved from a Radiant Six monitoring dashboard to mm -hmm. you know PR kind of solutions. I mean, obviously, we're interested because we 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 Silicon Angle, we we stay on top of that and try to use it. What do you see the whole social media world evolving into? Because it's becoming so much more data driven. Social media data has social yeah. data. 
I think everything's becoming more data driven. I mean, you know, that's why I think, you know, big data is one of the mega trends of this decade, right? I mean, data is going to be key in everything and specifically around the social data. I mean, you know, you see a huge amount of companies now who had all of this data that was just kind of like business intelligence data. It was about their inventory, their orders, whatever it was, internal stuff. And they're seeing this huge wave of like unstructured, quote unquote, big data or social data out there. And they're now trying to join the two. And so you look at companies like Salesforce who are basically saying, look, we, you know, we're betting the, the farm here, right, in the large part of any office on this kind of like social data out there and the consumerization of IT. And as those two things come together, I think there's some highly interesting, you know, opportunities for, for the company's investments or for companies to go after over the next kind of five to ten years. What, do you think Salesforce has gotten flat-footed or, or you think they're poised to take advantage of the, of the growth? I mean, they had a lot of legacy infrastructure. Mark Benioff said in Structure event that he had to rewrite the code. There's obviously, obviously acquisition binge right now, mm -hmm. patch working together some stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think we're going to see uh, probably at the engine level, right, um, you know, a bit of retrenchment and kind of like switching out. It's, it's really tough when you're running a you know, cloud service like that to, to switch out infrastructure. It, it's basically like, you know, driving down the freeway and trying to change one of your wheels at 70 miles an hour yeah. or whatever the speed limit is. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, uh, that, that's tough, right? It's yeah. not as simple as just keep shipping like shrink shop, shrink rush off every quarter a year, whatever it is. Um, so they're going to have to go through some of that. But, but at least I think the product strategy is super interesting, right? You know, so they have an execution. You know, um, uh, you know, challenge here. I would say, but okay. Know. So now let's put your uh, take your entrepreneur hat off for a second, and 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 if you were going to start today, and uh, be an entrepreneur or advice to an entrepreneur, and there's a lot of younger entrepreneurs who, mm -hmm. who are kind of getting in the game, either self-taught hackers. What are you saying? Oh, thanks. <laughs> no, no, well, you're like a platform guy. You're older. <laughs> I'm, you're an old, really, I'm an old. Well, guy. I mean, I'm old too. But we're old. So we're like, you know, been around the block. But I'll go crazy. We, we can't sleep. We can't drink. Uh, Jolt and do drugs and stay up all night like like the young kids do now to code. But I mean, the, you know, kids are much more savvy on the UI side. Obviously, JavaScript's got you nodes, know, big deal of it. Mm -hmm. You know, what's what they want to know what to work on. Like, where do you see the big opportunities um, as they try to grope their way into the market and they're hacking here and they're you know testing the market. And they're trying to get a feel for mm -hmm. something really needed to build. What do you see as opportunity? Uh, that's gaping um, holes. Yeah, great. besides <laughs> continuity. But besides continuity, yeah. of course, there's, there's nothing. Yeah, yeah. What second? <laughs> no, I mean, I think, uh, look, what is it are orchestration? We, is it? Well, I mean, on the server side, I think, you know, providing high, you know, on the, on the infrastructure side, providing high level tools to basically make it easy, right? I have this kind of like thesis that, you know, we have this new kind of like class of, uh, you know, role that's appeared in IT called the data scientist. And to me, that's like an accident of history, right? It's like the data scientist came along because there was one class of people who were programmers who were kind of interested in data and could hack code, or there were these other people who were like, you know, business analysts who could write code. And so we've ended up with this data scientist who writes code. But our job as the industry is to be able to allow the, you know, people who are used to sitting in Excel or sitting in like MicroStrategy to be able to do data science with really useful tools, right? That, you know, you shouldn't have to write code to actually get value out of the data. Yeah, yeah. So I think there's a great opportunity there on, on, on the, that side. But, on the flip it's kind side. of like in the engineering days, yeah, that right Fortran to do any kind of engineering in the 80s, if you remember those yeah, days. Right, yeah, right, exactly, right. Uh, you know, so I, I think on the, on the, you know, I mean, everything that I think about personally is around data, right? I mean, I think data is kind of like the lifeblood of, you know, the world, the, the enterprise and the, the uh, companies out there. So if I'm a young guy with spiky hair thinking I know how to do JavaScript, something around data on the front end, right? You know, no longer any static experiences, there's no point, right? You know, whether you can go and grab onto the interest graph or the influencer graph, those right now are kind of like key areas, I think, in, in the social side and the kind of like digital media side. And then what happens on the back side of that, so personalization and you know, optimization, all of that sort of stuff. Awesome. Todd Papiano from Battery Ventures launching here on theCUBE at Node Summit, the groundbreaking event, inaugural event for developers around JavaScript on the server side, great stuff. Uh, Continuity is a startup. Look for funding announcements this Friday. Uh, Rockstar in the Hadoop community has been on both sides. Big player at Yahoo. Uh, and that was the core team that spun off essentially Cloudera, Amar Awadala, ex-Yahoo, and the Hortonworks guys, all the ex-Yahoo. So Yahoo, big player in Hadoop. You're going to take advantage of that launch, a new venture. Congratulations, CUBE Thank alumni, you. making it happen. Todd, there's a job much. for you as a correspondent in big data. And Always a pleasure. Uh, we'll be right back in five minutes with our next interview.
The Cube is this conceptual box, if you will, and we bring people inside of the Cube and then we share ideas, but those ideas don't stay inside the Cube. We explode that idea. We allow that idea to grow and grow, and it does.